full of too many football podcasts comes another football podcast. One man's quest to find the answers. Okay, boys. Let's go to work. Now, live from Pine Grove Studio B, it's Let Me Be Frank with T. Frank. Penn State surprised a lot of people this offseason by bringing in more transfers than they have in the past. And some of the transfers and the positions they brought in were equally surprising, including Baylor transfer John Lovett. Now, the super senior running back comes into an already crowded backfield. So what was James Franklin and his coaching staff looking for? What sort of skills does John Lovett have? We'll get into that right now. And I think the biggest thing that when you want to talk about his skill sets, what he brings to the table, good vision. Lovett is a really good runner at following his blocking scheme. He will maximize the yards that are there, whether it's he needs to get third and short and he needs to convert that. Even if it isn't with power, he's able to find the lanes and he's able to follow his blocks and get a lot of yards. And when he gets into the open field, as you see, he sets up things very well. A tough runner that when he can, he will break tackles in the open field or he can just get downhill and get the yards that are there. It's a mature running style. And for what Penn State has in the backfield right now, it's something they needed to inject. Especially as you can see, he's a good gap scheme and uh, inside zone runner. So he is versatile enough to be in whatever blocking scheme Penn State decides to run, which they run now a much more diverse portfolio of uh, running styles, running systems. So he's a really good fit from from the dependability factor. And with a lot of young running backs on the roster, either young in experience, young in age, or young in maturity, if you want to be a little more blunt about it. John Lovett is a mature football player who shows uh, a well-rounded game. And the other thing that I think he does really well is he's elusive. Of his physical skills, this is his best skill, is that he will make people miss in the open field. He's quick. He's got good straight line speed and good explosiveness, his start and stop ability, natural runner with good agility and movement skills. Uh, And he's a big player with all of that at six feet tall. So he's an agile big man who, as you can see, he can put his foot in the ground. He's a good cutback runner and he's also a good uh, one cut runner. So he can do a couple of things pretty well. And I think that this is, is a huge advantage again of getting all of the yards that are there and being able to create on top of that. Uh, And when you look at those skills, smart, mature football player, also a guy who's elusive, who's fast, and honestly, when you look at him, he looks like a receiver. You'd think he'd be a good receiver. Baylor did not use him a lot in the passing game. They didn't use their running backs a lot in the passing game. So while the skills seem to translate and you would think would translate, I don't necessarily know uh, that there's evidence of that although Penn State has not really used any running backs in the passing game to a large extent since Saquon Barkley. And by using in the passing game, I mean more of targets downfield and something more than just bubble screens or what you saw there, release routes and stuff like that, of actually making that a integrated part of the offense. So whether or not that skill is developed now going into his uh, sixth year is, is remaining to be seen. Um, the one area that I think is the most obvious when it comes to his physical portfolio is the lack of power. Again, built like a receiver, also in a bad way. Doesn't have a lot of lower body thickness at six feet. He's one of the few guys when I look at a, uh, when I look at the roster and I see he's six feet tall, I don't question whether or not that's a legitimate uh, roster size. He's a tall running back. He's, uh, you know, got a thinner frame and he's not going to move the pile. And while Penn State already has that on its roster, it's important to point out that if you're looking for roles and defined positions for guys in a crowded backfield, he's not going to be your power back. He's not going to be your third down back. He's definitely going to have a much more specialized role when you've got uh, guys that look like they're trying to try out for the next Terminator movie or the next Predator movie in Noah Kane and uh, Kevon Lee, who's rounding into that lead back sort of build and play style. So it's that is one thing where I think if you also look at his total game it, it it explains where his ceiling is of 
a fifth or sixth year running back who hasn't gone to the league already, there that means that there's probably a defined physical ceiling on his abilities. And while he's a very good football player, he slots into that role of a dependable sort of back. Um, and when you put all of that together, what I'm trying to say is if a team is a good run defense, Iowa State known as a really good run defense full of good tacklers that are taught well, there is the limit of this guy isn't going to take over a game. He's going to get you the yards that are there, but if they're not there and the defense has a cap on it, he's not going to be creating outside of structure to give you those wow plays and those big moments. So dependability, versatility, those are his skills, but still that high-end potential, that breakout performance. It's not going to be John Lovett based on his skills and what we see on film, but he is going to be a really dependable, mature running back, which if you look at the roster, that is something that James Franklin has talked about of needing a guy to step up this spring and do it consistently. I think consistency is the thing you're getting from John Lovett. And finally, when you want to talk about his uh, pass protection, because that's another thing that he's going to have to do as you know, that particular skill set, he's a good pass blocker. Again, he's not physically dominating, but filling in that role, he can absolutely do that as the team's third down back and the guy who you count on to get the heady veteran plays. And I don't want to put him necessarily in a box as far as he's not going to be a superstar because production is a largely based on opportunity for a running back. So if he is in advantageous positions, the Penn State offensive line takes that step forward that everyone's been waiting for under Phil Troutwine, he could absolutely have a really good season. And as we've seen, multiple injuries to the running back position are also super common. So uh, there is a future where he is the lead back and gets the most yards of the backfield. And Penn State fans remember him favorably for being the guy they could count on. But that doesn't mean that from a tactical standpoint as a defensive coordinator, you're trying to stop John Lovett. So I think if you put him into a good role in the Penn State backfield, he is going to produce for you. This is Let Me Be Frank. Welcome to another edition of Beers with Brian with my buddy Brian. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We can we're down to one studio light and it's 93 degrees outside. So, you know, little victories every once in a while, right? Yeah, you can be a little shady today. I was out walking my dog earlier and uh, that wasn't fun. <laughs> it's dynamic lighting is what I'm calling this. It's, uh, you know, you, you want to have the lights and darks. Not everything has to be perfectly illuminated. Shadow is also a part of the composition and other boring things to say for people who don't care. Or as people who don't care say, close enough. So, <laughs> good enough, good enough. Speaking of close enough, um, you had an awesome idea. So I wanted to bring you on to talk about uh, previous Penn State recruiting classes and guys that progressed versus guys that didn't progress or kind of not just the simple um, re-ranking a recruiting class, right? So you mm -hmm. have the star ranking and then you have the guys ranked in order of talent and all that stuff. And then, uh, but this is more focused on guys who hit their upper variants of their skills, I think. So guys that actually progressed while they're at Penn State. Is that fair to what you were, what you were talking about? Yeah, I, I guess... Uh, from listening to your other podcasts, you've been breaking down a lot of transfers and um, recruits, and you always say, well, it all depends on how they progress. Well, right. I mean, that's great, and what kind of hope do, do fans have? And um, people like me, what, what hope do we have that they'll actually progress? Um, and I guess to do that, you have to look back into history over some guys, and I did look back at some guys, and um, just from like a fan perspective, you hear about the five-star guys and the guys who didn't pan out and you kind of focus on them, but you don't focus on the, uh, the, the three-star guys um, yeah. that kind of um, go for it. And we talked about it last time where Trace McSorley had the production that everybody thought Hackenberg would be. So while he yeah. was like a three-star quarterback coming out of high school, he ended up giving four to five-star production for three years, which is exactly what you want as, as a fan. And he's more beloved for it because he was a three-star and if he had been a five-star and put up the same thing, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so to put all of that in context for those two guys specifically, just to show the kind of drastic shift at that position, Christian Hackenberg set school records in passing and touchdowns, and then Trace McSorley broke all of them right afterwards. So guys that were producing on the college level, um, I, I think that's an important thing that you're bringing up is the star ranking and, and the production, because, you know, I'm, I don't want to step on the star ranking because I do believe it is useful. And I actually believe when you look back, there is uh, a good context of most three stars then produce like three stars and four stars, like four stars. It's, but like you said, you remember the five stars that don't pan out. So when we're doing this, you're going to be doing this from the fan perspective of the, the right. emotion and what you saw. And I'm going to try and kind of dig in a little bit to, you know, the production side and what you should expect from a guy who is, um, you know, coming in with whatever reputation he has. So one thing I want to get off the bat, we've selected a couple guys from the 2015 and primarily the 2016 class because those careers are complete. Um, and we're not going to be talking about Saquon Barkley. I even, I admitted Ryan Bates because he's a guy that started mm -hmm. right away. And, uh, you know, I think, obviously lived up to his four star potential. Now things in his career, I think changed his trajectory of moving to the outside, but he's still at the college level produced like a four star player. So I've selected a couple guys from both classes that I think are interesting cases of maybe perception is different or from my perspective, uh, maybe I was expecting too much of some of them. So we're going to get into a couple interesting cases. We're not talking about Miles Sanders uh, and we're not going to be talking about Saquon Barkley or the obvious guys or guys that mm -hmm. obviously didn't pan out on the other side. We're not talking about Dalen Darian. We're not going to be talking about Bretton thrift or, um, you know, guys that never played because obviously that that's another one. That's pretty obvious. One place, the, the place I wanted to start and one of the more interesting guys, because I need to get your opinion on John Reed. He's a guy mm -hmm. that I think you could go either way about John Reed as far as what he was. So, what is your initial feeling when you think about John Reed at Penn State? Uh, I want to say he had – I liked John Reed for the entirety of his career. And mm -hmm. um, he was the same guy when he, when he stepped on the field as a freshman as whenever he was a senior. It's just he, let, he had a little bit more leadership as a senior and a junior. Um, but what's interesting about him is um, he's like when we talked about, like, Pat a few – podcast ago Pat Fryerview is like when he came in he just like produced mm -hmm. and so you just expected the the arrow to always go up but realistically it did it wasn't like a, a steep climb it was gradual but he was always somebody that I depend I thought I could depend on when the ball left the screen and was going down the sideline if John Reed was the target I I thought that there was a good chance that it wouldn't be a long debilitating touchdown on the other end although that did happen a few times yeah well i always said john reed was a great corner and people got feelings about him because every once in a while he got dunked on because he was 5 10 180 so you know in yeah. those games like against iowa where he's six two the balls put up perfectly and maybe he could have made a better play of turning around earlier but he was in phase he was where he's supposed to be as a defensive back and that's a really hard thing to ask when a not so great quarterback makes a great play and then the receiver is six, two and jumps over you. I think there were obviously some at the catch point things, but you know, as far as like 90% of his job on that play, he always, I always thought he produced really well. Now he came in as a four star prospect uh, and I'm, we're doing all this according to the rivals rankings. So he was mm -hmm. um, the third overall ranked prospect in the class behind Juwan Johnson and Saquon Barkley. So on with that in context of he was highly recruited, he was one of the best players in this class. Do you think he lived up to that as far as a four star and a guy that you looked at as a guy who was going to be should be a player and you know at the very Oh yeah, he was he was one of the best players on that defense for a while. So I mean, I guess when a four star comes in, you're hoping that they either become like some elite um, NFL talent, or they're just really good for you for a long period of time. And if yeah. they overproduce, then they leave for the draft. And then you get to brag about how you, your team had a guy drafted real early, like Saquon. 
Yeah. Um, so you had, so you had both things there. Um, with John, I think he was more of like, he probably was exactly where he needed to be. He was a starter, he started for a long time. And, um, you know, didn't he have a failed punt returning history? Oh, I, I didn't get into that part of his, I was looking no, more I'm just the thinking, like, I, thought, I don't I remember. And, yeah. I think that they tried him out as a punt returner a few times and, uh, I'm not sure that he actually, uh, I think it was just a couple of returns a year. Um, but anyway, so he was a good player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so my, it was interesting. Cause I think my perception was a little biased by his early production. Cause you're right. He came in and was good right away, but some guys, they, that's when you look at what the star ranking lacks is context. And I don't want this whole show to be about a star ranking, but we have to have a baseline of analysis to talk about this of, uh, did they get better from where they were originally? And John, super smart guy, well-documented. You don't need me to tell you how smart he was because it's the first thing that people talk about with John Reed. Mm -hmm. So all of the, all of the technique stuff, all of the understanding of the game came early. And then it was the physical side to me that kind of put a capper on what his, his upside was. But then when he tested for the combine, a four, four, nine is good speed, not elite speed, but good speed, uh, 20 reps on the bench, strong, well-built. Uh, he had a sub seven, three cone drill. His short shuttle was fantastic. This is a guy that when I thought about it, I thought his ball production should have been better at Penn state. Then I look back at it. Nobody has been responsible for more incompletions from 2015 to 2020 than John Reed at Penn State. More than Amani Oruwariye, more than any other defensive back. Marcus Allen, doesn't matter. He has, he has forced more incompletions than anybody. So as far as a four-star, that's exactly what you want. He's a guy that I think lived up to the billing, and, and it depends on what you expected of him. And I didn't know what the fan reaction would be of like, well, he never hit that superstar potential. He never broke out to be a guy that was at all times like Amani had that sort of superstar potential. If you remember, he always was mm -hmm. able to get key interceptions. And in comparison, John was so steady and productive, but he didn't have those sort of like big play moments. And I didn't know if that shaded the opinion of John. No, I mean, he obviously didn't have that, but on those on the teams that he was on, he made them better. Like, I guess you expect some progression from a four star and Penn State's track record with defensive backs has been solid college player. Like that's yeah. been about the ceiling and he met that. I mean, there's not a huge um, disparity there. There's not been a lot of guys um, that have, you know, overachieved there. Even, even Grant Haley, like he was, yeah. he was a very good player, but I wouldn't consider him to be like a star. Right, right. And we'll get right. to a couple of those defensive backs in a little bit. Uh, next up, though, is a guy that uh, I think is going to be... Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk and talk with you. My dog's trying to go outside. So. <laughs> very right. impatient. We're, very impatient. We're doing, uh, we're doing advanced camera work here. I love it. Uh, right. My cat is going to be bothering me here in a second because I forgot to close the door, being that it's 90 degrees. Um, Kevin Givens. Three-star defensive tackle from Altoona. Um, again, when we talk about players that obviously had impact on the field, but he seemed to have left with a sour taste in his mouth from Penn State fans. Is that fair? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I know that I think a lot of it is because he left. Because he left early? Right. right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure. I think they probably thought that he could have stuck it out for another year and improved um, right. his stock, right? Um, but he was what he was. I really liked Kevin Gibbs. He was he was big fit. I was a big fan of his. Um, and he produced great. Like I think mm -hmm. at some point you expected him because he got better. The fact that like his numbers, I think, were probably pretty similar from his sophomore year to his his junior year, his second year starting to his um third year starting. But um sometimes you just don't see that leap in right. in, in stats, but he was good. He was he was a guy that put up numbers he didn't he was never going to be one of the elite Penn State defensive interior linemen because he was because of his size he was, he was six short, one, two, short and south yeah six one two eighty five is what he's listed at probably plays closer to 280 
Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And he was, in, I mean, he wasn't going to be Austin Johnson. Like he wasn't going to be a big plug up the middle right. or um, Daquan Jones, like those other guys that are big pet, like um, where Penn State fans have a little softer spot for those guys. Yeah. Um, he just wasn't going to be that player. Yeah. And, and to the counter of that argument of he could have stayed another year and improved his stock. Do you know that for a fact? Because you're right from a production standpoint, his best year was actually 2016. Like, again, if you look at the PFF grades and it's again, like a star rating, it's a shortcut for, mm -hmm. for metrics of evaluation. And, and that's consistent over time, not necessarily whether you agree with it or not, but it is a good baseline for, for comparison. And his pressure totals were the, were the same the entire time. His defensive grades were the same the entire time. And I, I think his skill set as far as his ability to create penetration and work off of blocks, the things he did naturally with that strong Aaron Donald like body type of being really mm -hmm. stout, having great core strength. Now the comparison ends there, but none of that was getting any better. So why would you stick around for another year if your skill set has reached its limit? And he was undrafted. He has been a part of the San Francisco 49ers. He got significant playing time in 2020. All of that to me says he made the right decision and that he produced at the college level. Again, no other player from the defensive tackle position has had as much impact as a pass rusher as Kevin Givens did as a three-star. So when we talk about hitting the high end of variance, Kevin Givens did that. Kevin Givens overproduced for what he was and then left because he had reached the limit of what he was. Right. I mean, I, I, I get that point of view. It's just from a fan's perspective, if you leave with a year of eligibility. And you're well, not a first round pick, right? And then you're it's not like, a do first something or, for us. If you go undrafted, that, I mean, that's, I think that's the difference maker is like when you do, when you go undrafted and you leave early, I think that's probably the thing that, that leaves a sour taste in people's mouths. Yeah. Like he it wasn't like he was like, you can understand what when people leave earlier and they're supposed to go in the first three rounds, like that all makes sense and get your money. Like I'm one of those people. It's like, if you're going to leave and you can get your money, get your money. Yeah. And I feel bad for the guys who leave early and don't get drafted. Granted, yeah. he's making probably what slightly over league minimum with San Francisco. And yeah. he might be in, in the league for a few more years, but yeah. still at the same time, if you, if you, you feel like as a fan, when they're leaving something on the table, um, especially because they were, I think that they've been thin there. Yeah. The last couple of years. And yeah, I, especially I mean, that three technique, they haven't had a guy that has stepped up to be that disruptor. Now, Robert Windsor did an okay job. I think that he filled that role adequately, but it wasn't the same thing as Kevin Givens where at times he was unstoppable. The other half of his, his profile, and this is why I was curious about is he would disappear specifically against Ohio State because that lack of length, I think they handled him a little bit better. Um, and I didn't know how that would paint for Penn State fans because he was so productive in other games, but against higher end teams, there was some struggles there to make an impact in big games. Yeah, I mean, there, all of those things go into account, but you know, the re realistically, you play Ohio State once a year, so you got 12 other games, 13 other games to, you know, win the hearts over, so to speak. Yeah. Whereas, as opposed to, like, you can look at it on the other side, too. If you have one really good game against um, Ohio State, then um, you can win fans' hearts, too. Like, like Seed Blacknall is yeah. one of those people, like, where he had that big catch against Ohio State as a freshman. So everybody thought, like, oh, the sky's the limit for him. And he was just kind of, like, the third wide receiver for his entire career. So, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you can see the antithesis of that as well. Yeah. Uh, and so speaking of guys that were in the secondary and solid players, four-star safety. This surprised me when I looked back at it. Four-star safety Garrett Taylor came into Penn State, played his final two, two years. What's the fan opinion of Garrett Taylor? Uh, realizing that he's a four-star, that's interesting. Right? Because he was like – he was just standard college player in my eyes. Yeah. Like I never, um, I liked when, I, like I, he'd had a couple of big interceptions. Um, and when he had interceptions, they were pretty timely. Um, and he was, he was sure back there, just like Penn States had done a pretty good job at safety of having guys that are pretty reliable on the back end. 
Yeah. But four star, I'm not sure he lived up to that. I think most people are so eh on Garrett Taylor and nothing against Garrett. I don't like being negative about 18 to 22 year olds. Uh, but four stars is, I, I think that's, I'm surprised. I, right. that doesn't seem like, that doesn't seem right. So he has a, he had a pretty classic sort of traditional way through college football where he was a, saw the field sparingly in 2016, 2017, and then took over a starting job, 2018, 2019, which is kind of what you're hoping for, you know, because Marcus mm-hmm. Allen was there for a while. Troy Apke was there and um, Malik Golden was there at one point, And then he finally takes over with Nick Scott in 2018, 2019. And the problem that I think was kind of the issue is that his better year was his junior season where he made more plays on the ball, he was, I think, a little more involved. And I haven't gone back to do the the film analysis to look at it. And it's hard to find old games sometimes of like, was he playing more free or strong? Was he was he the boundary of the field? And did that role change his production, which then changes his opinion? Because our opinion of, of coverage players is entirely dependent on the 17 plays where they're targeted in a season. Because mm-hmm. especially at safety, where most of your work goes unnoticed because you are a deterrent don't throw the ball here because I'm standing here versus I make a huge mistake. Somebody's wide open. And then we're going to blame the corner because he's the guy that's in picture. Uh, So you're right. As far as dependable guys, I think Garrett Taylor was a very dependable college safety. But when I saw that ranking, I was a little surprised because I would, I would agree that that doesn't match up. If you're a four star, I expect you to be, you know, a solid contributor in college, which he was with pro potential and he still has yet to make his way in the nfl at this point yeah i think that's probably the biggest thing is like if if you had to go by it it's 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 three if you progress you have a shot at the nfl right yeah four we would assume that you are going to at least be a fringy guy you have the you have the chance you you come in with a high pedigree yeah um, you should be because most, should most be a people draftable are a player yeah you should right. be a draftable player in the nfl second Maybe you hit, again, the high end of your variance and you're a first-round pick. But if you're a four-star, you should be in uh, of physical and technical potential for the NFL immediately. Now, right. who gets out of that is, is the difference. Five is, yeah, five is the interesting one because you you know that a lot of people don't hit on five and that might just be bad ratings. You know what I mean? You might just be right. playing against a bunch of kids who aren't very good. Um, the other thing or about you it just, is... Or you just physically peak. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say is when there's uh, the context that's missing to me when it comes to this is what is your growth potential? Because five stars are guys that and I've done a little bit of reading on. So I wasn't wholly ignorant is five stars are guys that are considered future first round picks. But you're right. Mm -hmm. If at 18 years old, you're as big and as strong as you're going to get because everyone develops differently. Um, my brother had a, a beard in, in seventh grade and is only two inches taller than me. It's not like he grew to be a six foot five, 240 pound guy. He just developed earlier than everybody else. If you're one of those guys, do you peak or are you, should you be looking for the three and four stars that have growth potential? And that's the interesting thing to what I think James Franklin does a lot is what they've done best at is identifying the body types that can develop, developing them physically. And then it's the mental and technical aspects i think that are the biggest wild card to me of the development process at penn state because you're right Mm -hmm. the five-star guy should be everything you want but when it comes to the you know identifying talent it's to me that you make your money in the three and the four star sort of guys who don't aren't the obvious ones but you can see something that maybe the evaluation can't right away right now i i i I agree with that and then I mean, we haven't seen a lot of twos come to come to Penn State recently. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot more common a decade ago, which I don't think a lot of people understand that it was very common for Penn State never to get a four or five star recruit. Right. Right. There was right. like there was a good. I mean, if you go back in time, and I know recruiting has changed a little bit. Not to get off topic here, but um, I I was looking back. I went all the way back to that. Uh, um, to the recruiting class with Dion Butler and mm-hmm. Justin King. And um, 
yeah, I, that one was probably the one that turned the tide because they had like two five stars come through. And yeah. then, then they started getting more players. But then like a couple of years later, Allen Robinson was a two star. Yeah. You know, and ended up putting up huge production. But yeah, Penn State doesn't get a lot of twos anymore. Here, yeah. They get more fives than they ever did. And they get, certainly get more fours than they did 15 years ago. That's something that's very interesting. Yeah. And they've, they've done a good job of, yeah, hitting in that sort of high three middle tier four. Hey, look, my cat's making his first <laughs> appearance on the show. Awesome. Um, so we'll move on to the class of 2016 before I lose my mind. Uh, the first one up is an interesting one to me, Michael Mennett. So Michael Mennett was one of the highest rated in this class when it comes to the star rate ranking in 2016 uh, behind, hold on, I got to pull it up here. Um, he was a four star and his overall rating according to rivals was 5.9. So just behind Miles Sanders as one of the best recruits in this class. Um, did he live up to that? Did he live up to being a, you know, cause they remember the other part of the story with Michael Mennett was in 2016, the offensive line was still thin and decimated by injury. So he and Will Fries, who we'll get to in a minute. I remember people were asking every week, are you playing either of those guys are, you know, when's Michael Mennett going to play? How's he doing? How's he progressing? When's the cavalry getting here and knowing how anticipated he was, did he live up to that? I'm uh, going to have to say no. I know I, mean, fr I framed it so you had to, kind of. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not like, like, I mean, was he, so, like, he had so much, he had so many issues. That whole entire interior line had issues against Michigan and Ohio State yeah. and against Michigan State at sometimes and against Iowa. Um, so, I mean, I know offensive line is about, being a unit and maybe there's some coaching changes that come through and maybe some yeah. philosophy changes, definitely some philosophy changes that um, were different between, um, you know, year one and year four. But um, I, I think people thought that Mennett was going to be a lot better, especially yeah. he was a PA guy, right? Like he was, he was somebody, was he local? Yeah. Reading. Yeah. Yep. You're right. So he, he was a local guy. So he already had that going for him. Like people wanted him to do well. He so it's dominate the state kid. And, yeah. Um, Oh yeah. 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 So I would say no, but I would put this type of, um, I put this type of asterisk on it. If you don't hear about the offensive linemen, good or bad, then they're average. Right. Right. Like, like if you're watch, like as a fan, if you're watching the broadcast and nobody says anything about Michael Mennon, and I guess you probably group Will Fries into this as well. They, they don't really talk about Will Fries. Yeah. He's probably doing okay, but if he was <laughs> doing really good, they'd be doing like the telestration and showing you like him running somebody over. Right. Um, but Mennon specifically never really, got, I don't think he ever got the telestration, you know, yeah, centers no, don't it's moment. hard it's hard to do that as a center um so the interesting thing about his evaluation so these are the guys that just came out for the draft and so a couple of these guys i have a, a bit of a more clear picture of their strengths and weaknesses uh michael mennett was always billed as the athletic center as the guy who was maybe a bit undersized but was mobile and could make every block and to me, the, the weird thing was he wasn't particularly athletic in what he did. So he didn't get up to the second level and seal off block. I didn't feel like he had super quick hips, but these were all the things that we were told about him uh, as a football player in high school. And again, that goes to that progression of physically, sometimes guys are more maxed out than you think. Um, but from the intangible perspective, I think it's important to also mention that one of the best offensive lines that we've seen under James Franklin, he was the center for and definitely mm -hmm. stabilized that unit to the point that they were one of the, the better run blocking units in the country in 2019. And he was a part of that, but kind of like um, Garrett Taylor, his best year was his redshirt junior year. And then in 2020, he was not as good for a number of reasons. Um, but from, I think he's a, to me, the more I think about it, he's a push. 
because of the position that, see, he that's, plays. That's fair. You if, know? I guess if you would – one of the big things, too, is, like, if he gets drafted higher, then fans are going to think that he was better. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he went into a situation in Arizona where I think you might see more of him than you expect because there's – I don't think it's a particularly good – um, interior of that offensive line. Now they've brought in guys that are veterans, but in a couple mm. of years, he's the type of guy that can absolutely play in the NFL in the right situation in the right zone blocking scheme. But I, you know, from, from a physical standpoint, I think I was expecting more, but from a production standpoint, it's hard to expect more from an offensive lineman, given that it's such a hard position and um, projection can be pretty hard. So I, you know, I, I, I want to say he achieved what he was supposed to, but it's a little disappointing seeing is what we started out with, which was he was the, he was the cavalry coming to save the party as a four-star offensive lineman after they had gotten mm -hmm. no four-star offensive lineman for how many years at that point? No. Oh, yeah. I mean, I do, I have to put the qualifier here that like, I like most fans do not watch the offensive line when I'm watching a football game. I only know if the offensive line is doing bad, if the quarterback is on his back yeah, or the running back is not running for any yards or um, any combination of those things during a game, which is probably why uh, Will Fries I'll probably have a worse opinion of, but yeah, that's just because he played a position that is like, you can get circled because you're getting beat off the ball. Yeah, by a defensive end more often. You have way more visibility getting beat in college off the edge than you do. Yeah, on the interior, the and you don't mm -hmm. have you don't have the help. So the other thing, so one of the things, and and get into the technical. Now that we're talking about the offensive line, and we'll transition into Ryan Bates here. Um, in the inside zone, and what Penn State runs primarily, primarily, and that's why I bring up that specific scheme, is that what it's built off of is it's built off of. You've got a front side, a back side in every run. And then you, as the runner, pick the hole opposite of what the defensive tackle does on the play side. So if you're Michael Mennett, technically you should be right every time. When if the guy is on your right side and you keep him to the right, then you've won your block. If he, if he crosses your face and you go this way with him, then the hole is this way. And you should always have control of that but the problem is twofold one when your guards screw up around you and then that changes your assignment and two if you're Michael Mennett and you're not a big powerful guy if you just hold your block but you don't create space you're not maximizing that particular scheme and situation and I think mm -hmm. that's one area where Mike Miranda has a chance to be you know maybe take a step forward to that position of he's a bigger stronger guy moving from guard to center he might have the chance to do that particular thing a little better um, and from Ryan Bates perspective that's one thing he was really good at when his senior year when he was moved into guard he just moved mother effers off the ball he could down block like it was nobody's business. So to mm -hmm. me, like when I looked at that, it almost fixed all of the other stuff that I was looking at over the last three years where he played right tackle. Yeah. I Sometimes you're put in situations, especially in college where they, um, and I meant to, I, some, what I think of just random things during the day when I'm doing my office job. And one of them is how many times do you think a college career or just any type of athletic career, especially in football, is ruined because you don't have a guy at a certain position, so a coach puts you out of position, yeah. like not your most natural position. And I think that happens a lot on the offensive line in college. Like, yeah, you may not be the best right tackle that, we, like, right tackle might not be your possession, best position, but you're the best we got. Yeah, like you're <laughs> at this point, you're the best right tackle we got. So while you may be more of a center than you're going to be playing right tackle, you know, yeah. and then you just, as, as you get older, maybe you progress into your natural position, whether yeah. that's in or out. And you see that happen a lot in college football. Like there are a lot of centers that play guard and a lot of guards that go on to play center. It's just, if you are good at blocking and you are big and you can handle it, then they're going to put you wherever you are. Yeah. I, you know, other than the situation, because he went to Indianapolis. And again, a lot of this is based on 
the high end stuff always leads into the NFL conversation. But if you're a Penn State fan, you don't care about that. Then you've got two guys in Michael Mennon and and, uh, and Will Fries who played for you. And of the two, Will Fries played more time out of position and gave up more plays out of position at right tackle. But to your point, Michael Mennett didn't have to face Chase Young other than if they stunted him <laughs> right. inside or lined him up at, at middle linebacker and just had him run people over. Uh, Ryan Bates, I'm sorry, I, Will Fries is the reverse of Ryan Bates to me. And that's why I keep saying Ryan Bates is because Bates is a better guard that played tackle, but had the feet to play tackle, just not the overall length to project to the NFL. And Will Fries had all of that length and had all of that uh, ability to play right tackle. And I, I, I agree with the decision to, to play him there and to try him there. And obviously, as you just said, they didn't have anybody else to replace him until his senior year where they had another guy who had the potential to do it. But when he kicked inside, his lack of, you know, high end foot speed didn't matter because he's got help on either side and he can go about pushing people off the ball, which was what he was best at. Um, mm -hmm. But he just straight up didn't have the feet to play right tackle, especially seeing as you're again, those highlight memory things you're facing Nick Bosa and chase young in your career. That's, that's tough, including uh, to Iowa, AJ Epinesa. And they had a couple other guys. Mm -hmm. There's some good pass rushers in the big 10 that are NFL level players that he had to go up on a regular basis. Right. And that's, that's where you line them up on, right? Like on the defense, you're lining them up against the right tackle. They, like, they that's, picked him. That's how you do it. They pick the yeah. best, they, your best rusher goes up against the right tackle. That's, how it works in the NFL. That's how it works in, in, um, in college. And I want to bring up another point on offensive linemen while we're, while we're here before we move on from these guys is when you look at, I mean, obviously I read a lot of stuff that Franklin says and how often does he marvel at offensive linemen? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. He always talks about like, you always hear of like, Oh, this defensive end is now running a four four, and they came in. You're like, holy crap, he runs a four four. Like, yeah, like like Owe. Whenever he came on, they're like, yeah, he runs a four three, and then actually ran a four three. Yeah, like that's pretty impressive. But you don't hear about like this. We have this freak offensive lineman who went from squatting X, and now he's squatting like twice that because he got on he's just physically progressed like yeah. that those are things that you we haven't heard a lot am i am i wrong about that yeah i think like we so. just haven't heard mm -hmm. that here i mean i know that they had a they gushed about a couple of young kids this spring i think were they gushing hard. about minute and fries i think it I, but i think it's hard to and Phil Troutwine said it best uh, this spring when he was talking about the position. He's like, there are so many facets. He compares it to golf of like, you can be a great driver and you can have a great middle distance game. But if your putting sucks, you're not a complete player. So I think you're always a little hesitant as a coach to say, we've got X, Y, and Z at offensive line because they might be good at a couple things but you don't want to oversell some guys. Like I, I, I think Juice Scruggs is going to be the next great lineman as far as He's got the speed mm -hmm. and the and the explosiveness, and those are two things that I look for even in big athletes. But again, he got into a car accident and like had serious injuries and has had to build himself back. So it's not like you're going to, you know, count on that until you see it. I, I think that there's a little more trepidation because it's such a hard position, it's such a technically advanced position, and it's one that Penn State fans and, and football fans don't pay attention to. So you know what? Un unless you have a superstar. I don't, I don't I also don't get it. Yeah. Like offensive line is I, I can just say this. And as somebody who like, I, I think I follow and pay attention to football. I, I don't understand the offensive line. Like <laughs> what they do on every single play is why I listen to you tell me about guys coming like running in front of your face and pushing in one way or pulling them the other, or, you know, running to the side where the guy isn't, it seems simple, yeah. but, most people don't get it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that, that's the, a very real thing because you, you watch the ball forever. 30 yeah. years old, probably have watched the ball every game, 30 years, every single football game I've watched. I mean, occasionally you, like if like Aaron Donald's on TV, maybe I'll watch the interior line. Plus they'll show it to you later if it was worth it. 
Like that's the other right, part. Exactly. They'll show you that play and be like, look how awesome it is. And then that's your, that builds your opinion. So it is interesting because also it's one of the greatest mysteries to most people when it comes to, uh, we didn't have any sort of metrics for evaluating offensive linemen where, you know, you, very few people dug into what you were and weren't supposed to be doing. And mm -hmm. it was kind of one of those things that if you weren't ever replaced, you were good. But that's not necessarily the case because you can just be rank average and we don't want to replace you, especially I'm thinking right now in the NFL where you have the options to um, yeah. and you have to make decisions. So it's it, I think that's been the biggest area of growth for all football fans and football commentators is we now have to pay attention to the offensive line because we now have ways to evaluate it more accurately or, or, or more broadly. Yeah, I mean, now, I mean, since what, like 2010, there's actually been grades on it? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, I mean, I guess that's the big difference. If, if you have, if you can Google, you can figure out if an offensive line is, offensive lineman is good or not. Yeah, so, and it, does, it doesn't And I have still to... think even, even at that, do you, like. Do you want to? We had, a, yeah. we had a really long conversation about this. Like, how do you actually tell if they're good or, like, if a running back's super bad? Yeah. Yeah, especially when it when it comes to differentiating the two on a run play, I think that's that's a really good point. Uh, I want to move on to our second to last guy, um, and that's Cam Brown. I'm very okay. interested in what you think of linebacker Cam Brown, who came out in the 2016 class. According to Blue uh, to to rivals, he was a three star athlete, but he did have a four star ranking in other places. So he was one, again one of those high three, low four-star ranking players? I think that he was not a highlight reel machine, but I don't think he was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, it just based on, um, you know, I know linebackers, you expect a lot out of them, but I don't think that he, he wasn't a huge highlight machine, but he did make some, he did make some good plays. I would say he was pretty, he was pretty stable. I'd put him in the John Reed category, like, he is stable. He was a good college linebacker. Yeah. I don't, as a, as a fan, I felt like whenever a running back made it to the outside, I expected him to get tackled if he was running over towards six. Like, I yeah. think that's, that, I think that shows a lot of value. Like, do you, it's the same thing with John Reed when I said, like when the ball was thrown in his direction, I felt like he could make a play. Same mm -hmm. with, same with Cam Brown. Like when the ball went toward him, I felt like he could make a play. Yeah. So it like for me, the lasting impression is just like he's just another one of the long line of like solid Penn State linebackers, but he's not gonna be, you know, Michael Parsons or right. Puzlesny or Dan Connor. He doesn't go in that category. But he was he good? Yeah, he was a good college player. So he's one of those guys that I put into this category of um, everyone expects now that now that Dwight Galt is famous amongst the Penn State football fan base for being able to churn out, you know, Greek gods out of the out of the strength room. I always point to guys like Cam Brown to say not everyone develops the same just because you because he came in as this skinny 200 pound six foot five linebacker. And I, in my own head, this is the reason I talk about this is I made this mistake of thinking he was going to turn into a 245 pound guy that moved well, had all of that length and was going to be a complete linebacker, but his, he got to 230 and that maxed out. Like he, he gained mm -hmm. 20 pounds. He was a good football player, everything you just said. But when you look at the three stars and you look at the growth potential, because I, I, to me, that's part of my evaluation was he had all of this growth potential, but then what is the actual hit rate in there? And from his physical standpoint, I was expecting more from what he was. And then when he didn't have that in, in 2019, I was expecting him to be his breakout player and he was good. So yeah, right, right. <laughs> I, I think that always happens like the fourth year linebacker, not to cut you off, but if, if a linebacker at Penn State is going into his senior year, what are the expect, are the expectations even close to being reasonable? Right, right. Or, I mean, seriously, they're not just because of history. It's not any of the linebackers fault. It's the linebackers that came before them. Yeah. 
So the other the other thing too, not just what comes before you, but I've been I when I looked at and did research for this conversation, I was I had to realize what's come after Cam Brown at that position has really should really inform me of what he did. So I looked it up and and um first off, do you know nobody has more sl- snaps in the slot for for Penn State during this 2015-2020 uh Cam, Cam Brown's third and he's a linebacker. So you've got John Reed, I forget who the other one is, and then Cam Brown as a linebacker was was that Will position, I'm sorry, the Sam position, he's playing out in the slot. He's in no man's land for a linebacker. And with all those things, he played really well in the slot. His tackling grade, he had a, a really good solid career. So for he mm-hmm. was a draftable player in the NFL uh after his senior season. So I've had to go back and revise my opinion of of Cam Brown because my expectations were unreasonable based on, you know, unrealistic things. But he was a really good player because Penn State has really struggled to find a guy to fill that position since he left. They have had a, a massive drop in production overall at that linebacker position, but especially at the Sam position. And, uh, you know, he played well in just about every facet of the game. So to me, he's a guy that of all the guys we've talked about, he's probably hit other than Kevin Givens, the most high end of that variance. And that should show you how unpredictable this is, because, you know, I was thinking it was going to be higher, but it didn't reach to that point. But it was still very good. That's still a very good player. I mean, he's with the Giants now, right? And he's yeah, he, he, he gets he gets time there. It's not like he's. He turned out to be a bad prospect either. It just, you're right. He was a, what'd you say, low four star? Yeah, high, high three, three low guy. four. Kind of, yeah. if a composite, he'd probably be a three and a half star if that was a thing. Right. So I guess the way to put it is like, like I said, he was always somebody that I felt like could make a play. And because, and this is go back to the entire exercise here, is the two guys that we've said who have lived up most of their potential or got the most out of their potential of two, three star guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Like, yeah. Like the, those two guys were able to physically progress and then uh, match production to their physical development. Like, and I think that's what's pretty interesting about the whole thing that we've been going through today. It's just like Cam Brown came out to be a solid college player in three yeah. stars or 50 50 on that. Yeah. Same with Kevin Gibbons. Like, yeah. they're 50-50. You, you sign a three-star defensive tag, you don't even know if he's going to see the field. Yeah. I mean, we obviously, we self-selected out the guys that didn't make it because most people probably don't remember them. But um, these are the guys that played, and these are the guys that that I think it should show how hard it is, even when you find a guy, to have a guy that is a difference maker. So you find these guys that are talented, and they produce for you. And, you know, even if they're not a superstar, you should appreciate what these guys develop into because it's so rare. Like it is so mm-hmm. rare. And that's why the, the high four and five star guys, you know, there is a higher strike rate of really good football players. I think if there's one area that's easily more easily identified, it's the, it's the high four stars. Like uh, Caden Saunders is a guy that I'm reasonably confident is going to be a difference maker at Penn state with his physical skills and his technical skills. And I don't care if he gets much bigger, you can play receiver at his size and be a guy that, the, that the defense has to, has to adjust to. Um, mm-hmm. I saved the guy that, and if you, you know how I feel about this guy, I saved the guy that I think did the most progression at Penn state for last. And that is defensive end Shaka Tony three-star athlete came into Penn state uh, as an undersized defensive end prospect and graduated this past year was a seventh round pick in the NFL draft. Despite that part, I think if there's one guy that maximized his abilities at Penn state in every category, it was Shaka. Yeah, I, I think you have to agree from a fan perspective. I thought he did a really good job. I but, mean, but I think, in if, the, but think of the, but think of the Indiana game this year. Yeah. And the other thing I like to, I like to look at is because we did not, pick um guys who didn't pan out or their careers aren't over yet how many times did they try to replace shaka or 
how many guys were brought in and he still was the starter. I think yeah. that that speaks to, um, you know, to his progression and what he was at Penn State and why fans liked him because yeah. he was, he made progress. He had big games and against big teams, he made big plays. And um, regardless of where he was drafted, like, I believe it wasn't it Shane Simmons was a, was a five-star defensive end and yeah. he wasn't the starter. Like, yep. Once again, you go to that five-star, three-star, like Shaka gave the production that you expected from Simmons. Right. Yeah. And so it's, that is part of the, the, what I find interesting is that given the run Penn State's had on pass rushers, whether it's Micah Parsons or Yitor Gross Matos or Adafi Owe, how, how is Shaka viewed in that light as well? Because again, going back to the stats, obviously I think if Yitor had stayed, this would be a different conversation, but he was good enough. He went in the second round after his junior season, but mm -hmm. nobody has more pressures in this time period. We're looking at than Shaka Tony and he's second in sacks. He produced on the, on the college football level. And from a technical standpoint, I think he's one of the best pass rushers I've watched at Penn State in terms of he was undersized, but kind of like Kevin Givens, he still had a strong core and he could bend the corner. He eventually learned how to not just be mm -hmm. a speed rusher and beat people with speed. He could he could leverage, he could bend, he could get underneath people. He had the flexibility. He had the, the burst off the ball. He worked to make himself as big as he possibly could, but he used his hands better than any of the guys that I just mentioned as far as he had legitimate moves and then counters to those moves. I remember, in, I think it was a game against Purdue. He, he, he started his speed rush to the outside and kind of like a basketball crossover, the, the, the right tackle fell over and he just ran right at the quarterback. Like those are, those are legitimate mm -hmm. moves. Those are ways that you immediately win. He had more immediate wins than any of the other defensive ends that we've talked about here, but the physical side of not being 255 and not having that, obvious strength is what held him back from the physical standpoint, but I don't think it held him. But my point is, I don't think it held him back because he found a way to be good with those, with those tools. Well, I mean, he also was more productive than an off way. Yeah. I mean, from a number yeah. standpoint, I mean, yeah. he wasn't the physical freak and clearly that's why he didn't go one and OA did go one. But I mean, if you put their production side by side and say who went first, and you did height and weight, who would you pick? It would be Tony. Yeah. Like if you did a blind test, that's the career that you would pick, right? That's if yeah. you said, who's going to be remembered as the better player? And you put both of their stats next to each other. And then um, you say one of them was drafted in the first round. And you're like, oh, okay, well, it's got to be this guy. But it wasn't. Yeah. Um, but I do, I mean, as a fan, I really like, I like Tony. It's, it's just, just, a lot of the reason, like a lot of these guys that have recently been, um, I think a lot of the guys that have recently gone to Manette and Fries and Tony, one of the reasons why I think that they don't, they're not as seen as highly regarded is because they were seniors on a team that wasn't very good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They so like they didn't achieve this, a certain right, the seniors level. on the seniors on teams from like 16 through through 19 told a different, Hold a different spot, right? Yeah, um, but that's perception, but, right? So right, that, that's what I mean, and that's yeah. and that's how fans evaluate. They they don't they're not evaluated it based on like, oh, you know what, they were good for what they had. It's like, no, how much did they win? Yeah, how much did they lead the wins? Like, I mean, at the end of the day, that's how that's how it's all gonna come down to. And and Tony was a good, he was a winning football player, um, and he didn't have. I mean, it's not his fault that. Um, they were so far behind in the turnover battle that it didn't even make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. The last one, and this is a bonus one because I don't really have any sort of analysis on him, but Blake Gilligan changed the special teams game for the better for Penn state when he got, and like it, not even from a fan perspective, from the frustration of watching bad play on the field, when Blake Gilligan hit his first 40 yard punt that wasn't returned, I almost got up and had a standing ovation in, in, in the press box because he was a competent punter at the position and we had not seen that in a while. And it was refreshing. Only you would want to stand up and uh, give an ovation to a punt. To a punter. Yeah. 
Well, no, I mean, no, just, it's, to, <laughs> just to a punt, to a punt, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I consider it when anytime Penn State has a punt, I consider it to be a bad drive, right? I mean, yeah. so as much as I, it's so just it's, it's nice to have Blake back there. Like, did it, ma- like, it, it mattered because he wasn't bad. Yeah. The best thing you can say about your punter is that he was not bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he Blake didn't get was in not the way bad. of success. Right. So that was like, it's not like he was like dropping the ball, letting it go through his hands, shaking one off the side of his foot. If you, I looked at this, I look at this earlier though. His average punt was the same for yeah. four years. It was like 43, 44, 44, 42. Yeah. Like he well, had, he did, he, he did didn't set up you. some big, he set up some big moments early in his career though. He, he put the ball at the two yard line. So Marcus Allen could, could mug that guy in the end zone after a safety. Like that's set up uh, by the punt. Well, I get that, but th- there is a p- point of that of the punt team that goes a little bit under, under the radar. And that's sure. Yeah. You know, the guy going down there was an Olympic sprinter. So <laughs> Like, yeah, when Shisena is is running down the sideline and he just gets there before the ball hits the ground, then yeah, I think you're going to be a lot better. Yeah. They had, or maybe I mean maybe you can't have one without the other. Um, it, what Gillikin was a good punter, and yeah, he pinned people inside the tent frequently, yeah. like very frequently. But what I think the funniest part is that like, how many like elite special teamers has Penn State thought that they've had at, w- when he was a punter? You mean like, as far as on like 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 Nick Scott made his like made his money yeah. because he was really good on special teams in college as as a guy who downed punts inside the five. Yeah, Dissetta yeah, made point. a roster last year because he did that in college. That was so ridiculous. Right? I, no, I, no, I, being, I laughed. At being that. dead serious. Like no, that, he did. I mean, You're we, right. We, we chatted. We chatted about that because. I thought it was fascinating and it still yeah. is. So yeah, you know what Gillikin, I mean, from a fan's perspective, fans love Gillikin. Yeah. Just because, okay. he, you know they what should. I mean? They should. Right. And, yeah. And he was like, he wasn't bad. That's it's like when you're not bad at the punting position, you're great. <laughs> yeah, no. It, yeah. There's, no, I hear what it's you're same, saying. Same thing with the kicker. Like if you miss kicks, you're awful. Yeah. It's not like, but if you make everything, you're supposed to make it. Like as a punter, it's like, you're supposed to make good punts. Like that's your job. It's the only time you get on the field during the game. It's an unfair expectation that we expect somebody to be good 100% of the time. Yeah. But yeah, Gillikin had so many punts um, that he said inside the, inside the 10 and inside the five that, um, yeah, he, he was a really good player, but it is funny that we have to end with a punter and that you would st- give a standing <laughs> ovation to a punter while everybody else is like running to the bathroom so that they don't miss the series on defense. They're like, you're over there standing up with a tear in your eye. <laughs> I, I also said I wasn't going to give any analysis and then immediately gave analysis. So, <laughs> right. You know, I don't it, No analysis on this one, but <laughs> you know, coffin corner punts. He did that. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, Brian, I mean, it, yeah. I, it is it is a fun exercise though. I mean, when you think about it, and, and we talk, we chatted about it. It's like this is like prime time to see. Like, it's very exciting to see these guys that were recruited two years ago and who haven't seen the field a ton, and yeah. these guys that were recruited this year and who might see the field. But I'm interested to see like who steps up. Like, that's my my favorite part about early football season and spring and summer is whenever it starts to get into July, which we're about to get to, and or I guess when this comes out, it'll be July. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. Right. So then you're it's yeah. like after 4th of July, it's almost football season. And yep. um, yeah, it's like, so you want to know who's going to progress. Cause you want to be the smart guy at the first game. You're like, Oh yeah. It's been reading a lot about uh, the, you know, the wide receiver over there. I heard he's going to be a, uh, he's, he's going to be a playmaker this year. Probably going to come out of the slot, you know, just those types of things, but it is fun. I mean, yeah. just to see who progresses. Cause Penn State's been really good at it. Well, if my mic here works, we'll uh, we'll end the show with that because I think that's a really good point. Brian, thanks so much for coming on. I always enjoy beers with Brian. This is Let Me Be Frank. So the show is called Let Me Be Frank, right? So it's time to be frank about something. And uh, this is going to be the final episode of the show. Um, I quit a job 
in February because I wasn't able to do things like this. I wasn't able to create. I wasn't able to speak and do things freely how I wanted. Um, quick story about how all of this started. I was going to start this show way earlier, but I couldn't think of a good name for the show. And names are super important. What you call something is so important. I had all the things that I wanted to do laid out. I had all the things, the vision for it. I just didn't have a name. So I was talking to my friend Tom, and uh, he's like, well, let me be frank. And I was like, well, there it is. That's perfect. So I just wanted to, you know, this is where you thank everybody for all the things. Uh, I want to thank Tom for being the spark that actually lit this whole thing to have it start. Uh, I'd like to thank Bill uh, from For the Bloggy. He is the managing editor and owner of For the Bloggy. I did a couple of episodes on my own channel, and um, he has said to me he's a fan, he was a fan of my work before, and when I started doing this, he wanted to be a part of it, so he's been hosting this on his channel. And I just want to thank him for being an awesome guy and somebody who's great to work with and is truly a professional when it comes to all the things that are not the creation, like this is what I do. He does all the other stuff so that you know about it and so that you see it and so it looks good on the internet. And, and he's done a great job with that. It's been a pleasure working with him. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Brian from Beers with Brian. I want to enjoy this stuff and doing this with my friends and having fun with it is super important because what's the point of, you know, like I take things seriously enough being able to have fun with stuff. Brian has been super supportive. He's a great guy. All my friends who have watched and followed the show or been looking at the podcast, like your support has been so appreciated. I, you know, Christy from Florida, good friend from high school, who's been super supportive of it. Um, it, it always sucks to end things. I, you know, even, even bad situations, it always makes me sad that things have to end. Um, but I have in the past, if you followed my work at all, I've worked with rivals in the past, Blue White Illustrated, and I've accepted a larger position there, which is going to prevent me from doing both. I'm always the guy like I, before pandemics were a thing, I loved buffets. Loved the Chinese buffet because I get a little bit of everything. I get to, I don't have to choose, but being an adult means that you have to make choices. Sometimes they suck. And having to put this down to pick up something else has been something I've been wrestling with for a bit now. And um, it just is, it, it's become too apparent that the next step in my process has to continue. So thank you for listening to my vanity here. And thank you to the people that have supported me throughout all of this. Um, the last person I want to thank is the person um, who uh, makes Pine Grove Studio B possible because Pine Grove Studio B stands for the guest bedroom. And um, I, again, I could not do this without the support of my wife, Zoe, who um, has kept us going while I've been trying to follow my dream. And, and that sort of support, if you find someone in life who loves you that much, never let them go. So thank you. We'll be talking again soon.